PowerPoint presentation, and today you get all three. What I'm going to talk about today is the, um, what, what philosophers call the epistemic question. This is the question of what can we know and how can we know it. And here is the fundamental proposition that I'm going to agree with, which will happen now. Okay, this is a, a, a comment which I'm assured actually was made by a very famous American football coach. Now, it looks stupid, but it's actually a very deep comment because there's a form of prediction in philosophy called retrodiction. And retrodiction is making a prediction about what you will find out about the past. And this raises a very interesting question. What can we know about times other than our own? So this is what my central topic today will be. All right. Once upon a time, my computer's not doing it. Good. Once upon a time, in the 19th century, people made predictions about the year 2000. And this is what they predicted. It seems, by the way, that flying cars have always been an obsession of futurologists. I'm still waiting. Sometimes people would make uh, predictions about the future which were a little bit more realistic. Right, so this is a prediction about what a uh, particular place in Vermont would look like in the year 2000, and it's not actually that far off, um, off the mark. This is a, a, from a book, by the way, called um, uh, Future Past, which I strongly recommend you have a look at. Now, here you see what looks very much like a modern city, although not in America because trams have long been lost in most American states. And, of course, we tend not to use dirigibles for um, uh, interstate travel in America and in Australia. But, nevertheless, it's not unrealistic. So when you think about the two alternatives, and, for example, this alternative, um, you start to see that there's a fantastical element to some predictions about what the future will be like, as well as realistic. And therein lies the problem. Uh, a couple more examples. You would learn about, um, well, you, you would do your education with headphones, not too far off the mark, but you'd do it by feeding books into a grinder and it would then be converted somehow to knowledge. Uh, as you can see, this is in French. Mobile homes were predicted, but this is what they were supposed to look like. Um, and, of course, then you get into the science fiction and popular science views, particularly in the 1930s. They would predict all kinds of rather weird and wonderful technologies, none of which ever came to pass. Okay? And the one I particularly like is the series that was done uh, in the late 1950s as part of the International Geophysical Year on what the first moon landing would look like. This was actually based on advice from Werner von Braun, who was head of one of the rocket programs at uh, what became NASA. So, obviously we've got some issues in predicting the future, and why is that? What is it that we can do about the, predict, you know, the future? Why are we not seeing undersea cities and so forth? All right, I'm going to propose a few basic ideas and I'm going to talk about each one of these as I go along. I don't need facts or figures, by the way, I'm a philosopher. <laughs> right, first of all, history is chaotic. Okay, I'll talk about what that means. Secondly, and more importantly, physics is indeterminate. I'll explain what that means. Thirdly, biology is contingent. Humans are, you'll be surprised to learn, complex. And finally, and most importantly, even if none of this was true, we don't have all the facts. So our problem with predicting the future is fundamentally a problem of knowledge, certainty and indeterminacy. All right, this isn't going to be, by the way, a philosophy of science lecture. I'm tempted to do that, but I decided it would probably not be a good idea. But nevertheless, I'm going to talk with some images which are a little bit scientific -y. All right, history is chaotic. Now, by the, by the term history, I mean uh, changes in the state of our world, both physically, uh, economically, socially, intellectually, all of these things over time. Okay, I'm not just reducing it to human history, 
I'm talking about the way the world changes over time. So don't think that I'm just talking about what's happened since the Roman Empire. There are two things about uh, that we know from uh, a branch of mathematics called chaos theory. And this is basically that you can get complex systems abruptly and without very much warning from very predictable deterministic systems, right, from a simple system. Simple systems can abruptly change from complex, messy, noisy events to very simple, this is in fact periodic orbits in a, uh, an n-body system, but don't worry about that. The other thing that can happen, of course, is a complex system can become very stable and simple. Sorry, I got that the wrong way around. Here's the simple one becoming complex, is the complex one becoming simple. And the thing about chaos mathematics is it's incredibly hard to predict these without actually doing the simulations. Right? You can't look at a system and say this system is relatively simple, there's only you know, 50, 60 people here, I can predict you know, what's going to happen, then someone pulls out a gun and shoots a lot of us. I mean, it, it's very, very hard unless you know all the facts and have the time to do the computation to predict what's going to happen. Okay? So this is a general fact about the universe that you inhabit. It turns out we don't live in Newton's universe. Sad, but there it is. Now the second thing I want to say is that we don't know things about particular things as much as we think we do. What we know is about averages. And we are incredibly bad at calculating averages unless we sit down and do the mathematics, or these days, if you're a scientist, you use R or MathLab or something like that. This is an image from a wonderful ad that was shown a few years ago by Sony for their Bravia TV, uh, which showed a whole bunch of these fluorescent coloured balls bouncing down a um, San Francisco street to uh, Jose Gonzalez's uh, music. And I invite you to think about, could you predict the path that one of those balls would have travelled down that street to within a millimetre? And the answer is, of course, you couldn't. If it hit a grain of sand at just the right angle, it moves off in a slightly different direction. It's another thing that's contingently, that you haven't put into your model of what's going on as it bounces down the, the street, quite deterministically, I might add. And these things multiply. But what you can do is say where are all the balls going to end up. In other words, you can talk about the ensemble of events, but not the path of a particular individual event. Now, that might give you some confidence that you can predict the future, right? OK, we can't say exactly where John Wilkins is going to end up in 20 years. He might be a wealthy man or he might be in prison waiting execution, but more likely the latter. But um, you can at least say what's going to happen to the population from which John Wilkins is drawn. Okay, so you can, okay. And this was the foundation on which the foundation series by Isaac Asimov was written. And he pointed out a fundamental problem. And that fundamental problem is what I will call the mule effect. The mule is a, an individual of particularly uh, unique individual properties. He's able to manipulate people to do what he wants and he becomes emperor of the uh, you know, galaxy-wide empire and he completely deviates away from the path that the foundation, which the series is named after, is uh, proposing will uh, follow and they're trying to make sure that there's a good outcome. So they're trying to manipulate ensembles and he's manipulating individuals and completely messing with the uh, statistical properties of the population. So when you are dealing with ensembles of objects in the world, what happens? Well, most of the time they tend to follow fairly predictable paths, but occasionally they don't. Okay? In other words, it works except when it doesn't. And this is a theme for inferences about the future. The next point I'd like to make is that history has layers. Oh, this, by the way, is uh, from a comic book called Red Sun, S-O-N, where Superman didn't land in the United States, but he landed in the Soviet Union in the 1950s. Wonderful comic, by the way. Okay, 
So what are the layers in the world? Well, traditionally, uh, philosophers have argued that the world is basically physical, and on top of that, you've got biology, on top of that, you've got sociology, on top of that, you've got psychology, and on top of that, you've got mathematics, which actually underlies, no. All right, let's just deal with the basic ones, physics. Physics is the science of what is possible. It put, puts constraints on the sorts of states of affairs that the world can actually realise. Okay? One of those states of affairs is if you put a lot of heat into a planetary system right, and it doesn't re-radiate that heat, it gets hotter, which is relevant to the previous talk. But people often think that if we know the physics, we know the outcomes. Except that this is a very complex little system that we're dealing with, far more complex than any other system we know, and one of the elements of that system is the most complex single object that we know, which is between the ears of every individual human being. How can we predict what these things are going to do physically? So it only specifies what is possible. But then, okay, maybe biology. Evolution is a, a predictable process, isn't it? Uh, we can see how ecosystems are going to change over time. No. No, it turns out that all we can say is what is likely to happen. We can't even forbid things, and I'll get back to all of these points. Now, society, culture, economics, the, whatever you want to call it, uh, I'm a bit of a proto-Marxist, so I tend to think it's economics in the end, but uh, that's another argument. Um, society tells you what is permitted, what sorts of things human beings will do, what sorts of things are likely to become an outcome, except that we don't seem to be able to predict that. Somebody made the joke at the uh, rotunda before that economics, economists have predicted 10 of the last five economic uh, crises. You know, I tend to think that economics is basically accountancy on speed, but that's all. All right, so, okay. None of this will work to predict the future, but there's technology. Um, Lynn mentioned, for example, that there are systems where uh, there, there are uh, there was a comment in one of the uh, quotes that she made where we're talking about the possibility of mopping up the overrun of carbon dioxide in the system so that we can actually get down to the lower limit of what we want in CO2 rises. Only that technology hasn't been invented yet. Okay? But we can have confidence that it will be, won't we? All right, talk about that technology. So let, let me go through each of these. When I grew up, I was taught, oh, this is almost pre-television, but nevertheless, when I grew up, I was taught at, at primary school that physicists were able to predict what things would do. Right? Particularly with uh, astrophysics, we were able to predict where the planets would be, when the next eclipse would be. We would know lots and lots about the nature of the solar system. When I got to high school, I was told, well, that's mostly true, but then there's indeterminacy in physics, in quantum theory, but it doesn't really affect st stuff like predicting where the planets were and so on. And when I got to university, I discovered that neither of these things were true. First off, we can't predict large-scale systems for very far into the future with very much uh, precision. There's a thing called the n-body problem, or the three-body problem, but it generalises, where if you have two planets or two objects orbiting each other, you can predict very precisely where they will be. Put three in and it becomes chaotic. How many objects are there in the solar system? Last count, a couple of million. And then there's stars that occasionally sweep past our solar system. We discovered Pluto, what, uh, 1928, thereabouts, something? We know where Pluto has been and we know where it will be for a couple of thousand years and after that we have no idea. Pluto, it's a big thing in the sky, right? It follows basically Einsteinian physics. There's no real mystery to the physics itself and we can't predict where it will be because it's too complex. Chaotic systems behave chaotically. Now, chaos mathematics is based on uh, deterministic systems. There's no chance or randomness here. When you're doing chaos maths, it's deterministic, and yet we can't predict what's going on. Secondly, even if we could predict what's going on, if we had a super chaos computer, probably from Apple, um, we would not have the information we needed 
to be able to predict very far anyway, because we can't measure with sufficient precision the sorts of things we need to in order to model the system that we're talking about. And, just to make it really messy, quantum, which Terry Pratchett says is a term to be used when you don't really understand what you're talking about. But basically in quantum mechanics, very, very fine-grained physical processes are not determined. Again, we have an ensemble of, uh, understanding of when a uranium atom will decay, but we can't tell you when a single uranium atom will decay. We can tell you of a sample of uranium atoms that half of them will have decayed into the isotope they decay into at a certain time, but individually we don't know. Okay. So physics doesn't give us very much in the way of guidance about what is going to happen in the future, but it gives us quite a lot of uh, decreased uncertainty. We're pretty sure that Pluto won't suddenly spontaneously disappear where it is and appear orbiting the Earth. Okay, that's sort of ruled out. Okay, so biology. <clears throat> again and again, people who are in the transhumanist movement, people who are uh, generally optimistic about the world and are therefore not philosophers, are uh, of the view that there is something like a next step in evolution. Uh, which will probably resemble something like the recently departed uh, Leonard Nimoy, uh, Live Long and Prosper. Uh, but in fact, that's not what evolution does at all. There is no predetermined historical process that evolution and biology is going to go through. There is no next step in evolution until a next step has been taken and we can look back and see what it was. Right? Evolution is not linear. And moreover, just because something can evolve doesn't mean it will. Now, what does that mean? This was a, an essay uh, published, I think, in National Geographic, but I can't remember, about what would have happened had the dinosaurs not become extinct. And, of course, the uh, assumption is, well, they would have evolved into something very like us, wouldn't they? Uh, every uh, paleontologist I know, and I do know a few, said that's about as ridiculous as it gets because there's absolutely no reason why they would look like humans. They'd look more like these guys, only with bigger brains. Anyway, that's another story. Um, just because intelligence can evolve doesn't mean it will. And in fact, statistically, human beings are a real outlier. We're, we're an accident, an accident of evolution. I think we reached peak intelligence about 150 to 200 million years ago, and basically everything since then has been noise. Which means that if we go extinct, and there's a very solid chance that we will, there's nothing going to fill the gap. You won't suddenly get tool manipulating crows as smart as crows are. Okay? So biology is contingent. We can't predict where it's going to go. At best, what it can do is constrain the sorts of things that are going to happen. For instance, as Stephen Jay Gould once pointed out, we will never grow wings so long as we have hands. Why? Because our biological developmental system, which we inherited from our last common ancestor with apes and every other mammal that ever uh, existed, and in fact most tetrapods, right? You can lose something complex like a limb, but it's really, really hard to evolve a new one. But notice I said really, really hard. I didn't say impossible. Now, if I was going to make a bet and come back in another 600 million years, I'd probably say, look, you'll never find a hexapod vertebrate mammal. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't bet my children on it. Or well, maybe one of my children. <laughs> so the point being that chance actually plays a very large part in evolution. Now, what do I mean by chance here? Well, I, in addition to the indeterminacy of physics, there's also what's called chance in biology. And chance in biology means something like not relevant to whether it's going to be useful or not. Okay? It just happens for physical reasons. You know, gamma rays from uh, some exploding quasar or whatever. But the fact is we cannot predict those sorts of contingent events. All right. So biology's out. Not going to help us. We do know some things, though. I mean, biology gives us a certain license to believe, as I said before in the questions, that 
If you extinguish every mammal, there'll still be an ecosystem here. If you extinguish every eukaryote, there will still be archaebacteria and bacteria, eubacteria. And these things, because we know how uh, we know the physics of biology, these things will evolve ecosystems and something complex will come out of it, but it might not be a complex thing like an animal. But since we're talking about complex, let's get to the, the, the nub of it. This is really about what humans will do or cannot do. Now I'm going to tell you a story which is a little bit controversial, okay, because one of the things I am going to tell you in this story is that solar power is not really the solution to our problems, but there is a technology that is. Okay? So, in the 1950s, the American military were looking strongly at nuclear power as the solution to our energy needs, and we all know that history, we know that story. But what's sometimes not realised is that there was one man who made a decision on which the American nuclear power technologies were based and which was followed by everybody else, including the Soviets, in great detail, to, to do civil power generation using the uranium cycle. Now, the, why did he choose that? What's really interesting is that at that time, the American Air Force was working on a portable <coughs> nuclear power system, which if it crashed, wouldn't explode or melt to China. And it was a thorium reactor, a uh, liquid uh, thorium uh, reactor cycle. Now, the thing about thorium is it's one of the most common radioactive elements on Earth. It's in all these bricks. Uh, you find it en masse in the tailings of, ironically, uranium mines. Uh, Australia has about 40% of the world's reserve of thorium. And thorium can be run in a small, compact, relatively lightweight, not, you know, it's a couple of... Uh, tens of tons, but it's not Three Mile Island or Chernobyl either. And it's unpressurised and so on and so forth. I won't bore you with it. You can go look it up. And the Air Force were going to use this to drive jet engines, which means that they could put a plane up and leave it up there almost indefinitely, All right? only having to come down to restock the bar. Now, Rickover, who was in the Navy, he wanted plutonium-based bombs, and you can't get that from thorium. What thorium does is it actually burns uranium and plutonium and makes relatively non-toxic byproducts that reach their half-life in 50 years instead of 50,000, and you can't make bombs from any of them. We can make medical uh, radioactive substances. So this is the 1950s. We had this technology in the 1950s. They built a working thorium reactor. You can turn off a thorium reactor on a Friday night and it just solidifies. Come back on Monday, heat it up, and it starts working again. Absolutely no danger. But we went with uranium cycle, which requires pressurised containers, uh, requires the use of water, uh, massive amounts of water, in order to cool it, and which generates toxic byproducts. So as a result, the Western world, and then eventually the Soviets, took civil power generation from the uranium cycle. The worst possible decision for anyone but a military man. Okay, we know how that went. A number of academics, including one of my heroes, Bertrand Russell, formed justifiably an anti-nuclear movement. What they really were was an anti-uranium cycle movement, but that doesn't play as well in the headlines. And so it became a standard view of the radical left that nuclear power was bad. Right? Nuclear power is bad because the uranium cycle was bad. Which it is. I mean, nobody doubts that. As a result of that, socially progressive political parties allied themselves with conservation groups who adopted this radical leftist view, which had the result that when we finally did get some halfway decent technologies developed in the 90s right, on the use of uranium cycle generation, the integrated fuel reactors, I think uh, they're called. Uh, Bill Clinton killed all of the um, uh, funding and that was the end of nuclear power. Now, why am I saying this? What, what's important about this? One is, one individual made a decision as part of a system and it could have gone either way. Okay, so it was contingent. Two is, for contingent historical political reasons to do with the Cold War, the Second World War and so on, and a, 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 a massive pacifist uh, movement in the 50s and 60s, 
right, it became intellectually respectable to oppose nuclear power. Three is that had we adopted nuclear power as our power generation back then, even using the bad uranium technologies, right, we would have had uh, no global warming, effectively. The Earth would have basically uh, equalised, there wouldn't have been carbon, right. So 70 years ago, we could have prevented global warming. We didn't, for contingent reasons, okay? Now, even if we had gone with uh, thorium, there still would have been issues, there still would have been deaths. Industries and technologies come with a certain frequency of injuries, injuries and deaths. Uh, but the point is, even with what we've got over the last 50 years or 60 years of uranium power generation, there have been fewer deaths in the entire nuclear industry than in one year of using carbon and fossil fuels for power generation. And we've been doing that for over a century. So think about this. Even with the very worst outcome, with, you know, cut, with waste and so forth to dispose of, etc., we still would have killed fewer people in the last 70 years than in basically 7,000 years of coal and fuel, uh, fossil fuels. All right. The main point here is that contingent events can really mess up subsequent downstream effects in human society. And yes, I'm a thorium booster. I don't believe fusion will ever be economically viable. And I don't believe solar power will be for a very simple physical fact, and that is to generate the amount of power that we need to run our current society, we'd have to cover the entire country in solar cells. Physics. What can you do? Sets the limits of what's possible. All right, maybe we can be hopeful about technology. And there is some good evidence in the past about how technology has solved some serious problems in the world. So in the early 60s, India was facing a major uh, uh, famine. And we were talking something like two to 800 million people were going to die of famine in India in the 1960s. An American biologist by the norm of uh, Norman Borlaug uh, invented a, or bred, a strain of wheat which could hold many more grains of rice per stalk than the uh, traditional strains that were used, and he averted most of the famine in the subcontinent. Similar things were done with wheat in America, uh, maize and barley and so forth, so that over the period, uh, what was almost certainly going to be a major population <coughs> catastrophe called a population bomb by biologist Paul Ehrlich um, didn't happen. Okay? So Ehrlich published his book, I think around 68, before the Green Revolution had really become appreciated. It wasn't even named until 69. And what really freaks me out is that I remember those years. Um, Ehrlich's predictions were that hundreds of millions of people would die by 1980, and it didn't happen. People did die, but it didn't happen. So maybe technology is a solution. Maybe there will be a solution yet to be found, okay? I'd like to say that Ehrlich was wrong, but he was very right in the way he was wrong. Because what basically happened is the population of the Earth doubled and we now have 9 billion people, oh sorry, 7 billion people in, on the planet. And the Green Revolution works because fossil fuels allows you to distribute, usually very dirtily, food around the world. And guess what? I think it was 2004, oil production peaked. We are now on the downswing. So at the moment, Ships that are taking food around the world are burning everything from canola to uh, uh, biodiesel to whatever they can find out in the open ocean because it's too expensive to actually use any clean fuels while they're out in the open ocean and they only use the clean fuels when they get close to ports and the end result is we are contributing to global warming again. Moreover, when oil not only peaks but becomes really a scarce resource, the whole distribution infrastructure of food around the world is going to collapse unless we can come up with a solution. And we don't know whether we'll have one. In fact, we don't know what we don't know. I'd like to read you a little uh, cartoon by one of the oracles of the internet. 
um, Vilbert. How long will it fix, take to fix any problems we find in our beta product? Asks the uh, pointy haired manager. This is a very early one, so he's very pointy haired. Dilbert replies, it is logically impossible to schedule for the unknown. Think about that. It's logically impossible to schedule for what you don't know about and to prepare for it. And of course, he replies, try to think as a manager, not as an engineer. To which Dilbert replies, well, in that case, we'll fix the problems before we find them. Now, there are two mindsets going on here. I think it's pretty obvious in the cartoon, right? How do you predict and prepare for problems if you're an engineer? That is, if you are someone who has to prepare technical solutions to uh, uh, real-world problems, which is what engineers do, right? and base their work upon the work of research scientists who tell them what can be done. Okay? Well, it isn't through the management approach, managerialism. I'm going to call it ad hoc thinking. This is the idea that we can somehow look at a situation and intuit, because we have massive brains, we can intuit the solution. And if you can't, what's wrong with you? Right? The managerialist view seems very widespread. It's widespread, certainly, in the education system at the moment. He said, not having a job in academia anymore. Um, but the point being that ad hoc thinking, the idea that we can somehow intuit the way the world is and come up with a solution when we don't know what the problem is, let alone what uh, techniques we might use for the solution, let alone what techniques will succeed, is a fundamental mistake and a fundamental psychological foundation for a lot of the problems we face today. If the future is indeed uncertain, and I'm going to argue in a second that it really is, right, the only way we will know if our solutions were feasible, let alone successful, is when they fail or succeed. And at that point, it's really too late. This is a this post hoc thinking, I call this, after the fact. Right, this is towards the fact, this is after the fact. This is a, a lesson that we learned from Darwinian evolution. You do not know what solution will be successful in a species adapting to a new environment, particularly you know, a thousand part per million uh, of CO2. You do not know what's going to succeed or what isn't. Uh, in artificial intelligence, they talk about this as the hill climbing algorithm. You throw out a bunch of solutions and the best one is the one you choose to throw out the next lot from until you get to the local optimum. And if the threshold for the uh, problem solution is higher than the local optimum, too bad, you're gone. We don't know. We can't know. We can't know because physics won't tell us. We can't know because biology won't tell us. We can't know because uh, Isaac Asimov's foundation won't tell us. Right? We just can't know. We can't know with variable degrees of uncertainty. Some things we're less uncertain about. Like I said, Pluto's not going to suddenly pop up next to the moon and do a little dance. But we don't know where Pluto will be. We don't know what evolutionary outcomes are going to happen. We don't know what... Uh, one of the big problems I've always had with total free market economics isn't the rapacious greed of the, uh, the people who run it, okay? It's the fact that um, we don't even know if those solutions will succeed in the short term because we can't predict all of the different variables that are in action there. And in the end, you only know what works after it's either worked or not. So what I want to do is I want to present to you a generalised view of life, the universe and everything. This is you. Okay, I didn't put you in there because I didn't have a good recent photo, but that's you. And this is your time horizon. This is the, the now. This is the world you live in. And one of the things about the world you live in is that you have degrees of misinformation and degrees of uncertainty just about the now. I'm pretty sure you're all here, philosophical conundrums about certainty and what have you notwithstanding. But I don't know what's going on outside there. I've got less idea of what's going on in the United States, although I can guess. And I have absolutely zero about what's going on in Uzbekistan. Because I know nothing about Uzbekistan, not even how to spell the country. All right. So we've got some uncertainty just about the now. Okay? Let alone things like economic uh, indicators and so forth. But think about the past. Right? 
How do you know what the past was? Well, obviously, we look at records and we find out and so forth. So I ask you this question. What did Julius Caesar eat for breakfast on the morning of the day he crossed the Rubicon? We don't know. Think about this. If you find a ball bearing at the bottom of a hemisphere, nice smooth metal hemisphere, no friction to speak of, you know, and I tell you that it's never left contact with the ball, you know that it started somewhere high and it's moved down until it's reached equilibrium. But you have no idea how it did that. And this is something that every uh, casino trades on with roulette. Okay? You know it's going to end up in something. You don't know where it's going to end up because there are too many slight variations. Uh, how hard was it pushed? Did it have any lateral spin, etc.? Was it, was it um, moving up and down as it was being done? All this sort of stuff. You don't know this. All you know is it got there by moving against the surface. So there are some things you do know. You only know that because I told you. But there are things you don't know. And how many things don't you know? an infinite number of things, or as near as damn it for human uh, consumption. So, we do know the world more or less at present, more or less being the operative phrase. We have degrees of uncertainty based on partial information flow, incompleteness of information, uh, uncertainty or uh, inadequacy of the information, or even a complete loss of the information on the path from there to here. And this is also true of the past. Okay, information is lost not only from the present, but also from the past. Because if anyone wrote down what Caesar ate that morning, it's not being preserved. And anyone who's ever done history becomes radically aware how little we know about the past. Nearly all of it is conjecture in such fields as uh, archaeology, uh, uh, political, social, economic histories and so forth. We only know what has been recorded and we're not even sure how to interpret most of that. So we have insufficient information, insufficient certainty, insufficient precision to predict the future. So to get back to my original slide, when I was a kid, I was a mad science fiction fan and I read Arthur C. Clarke like he was gospel. I've reread some of it and I wonder why, but then I was only eight at the time. And I read in the newspaper that uh, some uh, film director or other I'd never heard of, you know, Brick or Cub or something like that, was making a film of one of my favourite Arthur C. Clarke stories, which was The Sentinel. And the story became 2001 A Space Odyssey which is a film you should only ever watch when your consciousness is altered. But it had some wonderful lines in it. One of them was the computer, HAL 9000, telling the uh, astronaut stranded outside the spaceship that he can't let him in. We cannot actually do that. No matter how good our computers, how good our information, there will be a limit to what we can predict about the future, and there will be massive degrees of uncertainty about what's going to happen in complex systems. So. I can't leave it without some sort of um, uh, advice. Now, I did say I was a pessimist. I'm actually a fairly optimistic pessimist. What can we do? There's a saying, if wishes were horses, then beggars could ride. Okay, here's a beggar on a horse. The thing, however, is that sometimes we get it right. Sometimes we get it very right. And if you don't try, you won't succeed. Okay? If you don't actually try to solve problems, there's no chance of you solving them. Even though if you do try, there's no guarantee that you will. So don't despair. Likewise, don't be arrogant. Don't just assume that we can solve our problems with technology. Don't assume that if we know the techni technological or technical solution, that we can, we can convince politicians and economists and companies and all the other vested interests to adopt them. This is exactly what Lynn was talking about. And finally, don't believe that good intentions can equal good outcomes just in virtue of the fact that you've got the right intentions. You've got to fight very hard to get an outcome against the flow. Okay? So, thank you very much.
There's one up the back. 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 So they have to go for it. Can you stand up, please? Oh, I just wanted to say, I uh, yeah, really enjoyed the talk. Um, yeah, it's always good to hear you speak, particularly I liked the aspect of um, indeterminacy of the future. Not that I'm not sure uh, quantum indeterminacy, there are other theories that do suggest that physics is determinate. Oh, you're talking about you're talking about sub um, well, uh, plank sub plank deterministic theories, yeah. I would love to live in a universe where that were true. I would love to live in a universe where it turns out that the indeterminacy is in fact not indeterminacy. But I've been roundly wrapped on the knuckles by every physicist I've suggested that to and um, uh, told that as a philosopher I don't understand physics. I suppose the fact that some mentioned is probably the for it, but an example is the uh, gravity theory where technological advance for the most part came to a standstill for the random people of the empire. That was because the wealthy class realised any change that came along really distributed wealth. They didn't want it. Keeping things the same meant the uh, wealth was included and accumulated the most certain class. I mean, example is the 19th century where the the spate of technological change was so rapid that some great machine would be produced at one point, and then six months later another machine would be produced which would do three times the work at half the cost. And of course the guy who had invested for while doing well, I took my battery, I've invested in this great machine, is suddenly broke. And it was seen in the Roman Empire, they saw that problem and made sure there was no progress. Well, well, I don't know, there must be a name for that sort of... Uh, I, I think the name is human nature. It's always been the case that every society is, is structured in such a way that there are those who benefit or see themselves benefiting from the status quo and those who see themselves benefiting from a change in the status quo. However, um, one of the things about these changes is that they almost always happen as the result of some unplanned outcome. For instance, the rise of capitalism in the West is in large part due to the um, uh, Black Death in the mid-14th century, which made labour a premium and permitted peasants to move between their feudal lords. And the feudal lords had a greater interest than in maintaining the status quo at that point, which was maintaining their income. So they started to pay more, and as a result, we started to get guilds, etc. And that kicked off the capitalist uh, revolution. Um, and that was a purely random effect from the perspective of economics. Yeah, we know that it was caused by, caused by Yersinia pestis and the, and the importation of fleas and, and so forth. But we don't know. We, we couldn't have predicted that ahead of time. It wouldn't have been within the purview of a, a 14th century economist. Um, the other point I would make about that is that um, um, in the 19th century, yes, many fortunes were made. It looked like a major social revolution. One of the very interesting things is that the people who were traders, the surnames of people who were traders in the 18th century in Britain are the people who are still within the 1% in 21st century Britain. It's not so big a uh, radical change as you might expect. Uh, so I suspect that um, we see change more through a kind of rhetorical lens than we do through any kind of actual evidence. Uh, we now have an era of exclusionary uh, wealth ownership that exceeds the Gilded Age at the end of the 19th century, right? Basically, most of the 20th century in America and Britain and so forth was a statistical blip in terms of the control of the wealthy over the poor. So, yeah, look, you're, you're right to some extent, but I don't think it is actually them preventing um, technological change so much as nobody really cared. They were making money. There was a status quo. There wasn't any uh, opposition power in the Roman Empire to really challenge that. And by the time they did, basically the systems had collapsed. I, I said before I'm a bit of a proto-Marxist. Right? I think Marx was right in many of his... Uh, Diagnoses. I just think his cure was worse than the disease. 
Uh, I actually think most of the things that happen in history happen for socio-economic reasons not connected with any of the dialogues that people are carrying on, which is the reason why I believe global warming is so broadly opposed in the modern world, is because it's not in people's individual interests to change. Yeah, the planet's going to die, but they're alive now. Okay, we have one. Okay, we have a couple more. Lynn Ellison and um, Susan. Sorry, who wants to go first? Um, I'm I think okay. you can. Um, John, I was interested in your comments about thorium. Um, that's not something I know anything about. Mm. And it seems hard to believe that there's no downside to it if no one's. Mild downsides, it. nothing like any of the other power sources, including solar power which has such a massive environmental footprint in the manufacturer at the moment, although that may change with some recent uh, developments. But, um, Guilty is charged around nuclear energy, mm -hmm. um, and it's my understanding that there are still nuclear power plants being built, although not as many. Uh, but that the major problem is not, um, is not so much people like me or even dealing with the waste, but the cost of setting them up and the cost of um, decommissioning them at the end of their lives. A lot of that's going to have to do with the economics of actually imputing the real costs of power generation. At the moment we don't impute the real costs of coal or even solar power to uh, either the consumers or the governments of the nations in which it's happening. I think that uh, because nuclear power never really kicked off as a broad scale thing, it didn't end up getting this corporate welfare that the oil and, and other manufacturing industries gets. Um, and one of the interesting things about thorium is that it will burn existing reserves of uh, separated uranium and so forth, uh, spent fuel rods, and it will result in there being uh, less nuclear waste. We've generated an awful lot of it, it'll take about a thousand years to actually burn through it. But the outcome of the thorium cycle is that it results in byproducts which are not nearly as toxic as anything that comes from any other power generation process. Not, e not even wind. That's a bit about nuclear power. The IPCC publishes the most cost of energy for every nuclear power plant. Yeah. And that's the cost of nuclear power. It's not the cost of nuclear power. It's the cost of nuclear power. It's not the cost of nuclear power. It's 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 the cost of nuclear power. The biodiversity and environmental costs that you lose through the kinds of processes, the industrial processes, and I believe nuclear power, even with the uranium cycle, would end up being cheaper than any of the other things. I'm not even talking about. That's, that's what I mean. Real costs. Time, uh, we, we have to focus on both the environmental costs and the environmental costs. Yeah. 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 Ye